imagine. Sorry guys for the interruption. We are so sorry. So sorry for that. For that interruption. This is a new stream guys. So for those who had left the live stream guys, you are welcome. Please do not just we apologize. Technical problems really happened. I'm just so dumb. I'm frustrated at the same time. Him. I'm frustrated at the same time, but I don't know what to do. But guys, let's just wait for you to join, guys. It is been everyone has yeah. abandoned us. There's two people watching now. It's not easy. And I don't blame anyone. It's not for good, jumping out. But, uh, I mean, it's not nice. let's try this again. Welcome back. <laughs> I'm so frustrated. <laughs> I feel so frustrated, guys. But nevertheless. The show goes on. Welcome back. Um, we're using a makeshift uh, stand here. Um, and for whatever the reason, he just rejected the phone off the stand. <laughs> so, you know, whenever you do a live event, <laughs> life happens. So, sorry about that. And yeah, welcome back. Welcome back. Um, I think we were in the middle of discussing why you guys should start farming right away. There was a point I was about to go into before the premature ejection from the world of YouTube. <laughs> <Just pregnant. laughs> yeah, yeah, this phone is uh anyhow. So long story short, guys, when when you when you are considering getting into this business, hopefully can you guys hear us okay? I'm not even sure if the Bluetooth is still on. It's still on, by the way. Please let us know if you can hear yeah. us. I was just deleting the previous stream. So typically, you know, when you set your business plan, and please don't make the mistake of thinking just because you're starting a farm, you don't have to, like it's not necessary for you to have a business plan. Any business you're going to run as a real business, you need to have a business plan. You need to have a, a an entry point. You need to also have your exit strategy plan ahead, right? And that exit strategy can simply mean you have a succession plan. What does that mean? You don't want to start a company that's only going to survive while you're alive, okay? You also need to have it set in a way that whether it's your business partner that's going to succeed you, whether it's your son or a brother, and don't make the mistake of thinking just because you have your son or daughter, that's the most qualified, that's the best person. Thank you, we love you guys too. Don't make the mistake of thinking just um, just because it's, a, it's your relative, that's the most qualified person to take over the business. That's the most companies that tend to fail after the founders are no longer with us on this wonderful planet of ours is simply because they just defaulted to, oh, my husband started this wonderful business, so the, my wife started this wonderful company, right? And now all of a sudden, you know, he's, he or she is no longer around or no longer capable, right? Or no longer have the energy to run the business. Let me just let my son take over. Let me let my daughter take over. It shouldn't be like that. It should, the, the succession plan should be within your business plan, right? That opportunity to take over the business mm -hmm should go to the most qualified candidate. And sometimes it may end up having to go to the brother-in-law. It may end up having to go to the sister-in-law, right? But if we do our job and we prepare our sons, our daughters, you know, we expose them to the business and they develop a natural love and compassion for the, for the business, then your succession plan is already in place, right? And so, you know, that's how detailed you need to be when you're entering the business, right? When you're entering any business, anything you're going to put your time, money, blood, sweat, and tears into, you have to have a plan of execution because without that, right? What's the oldest saying around? You know, if you have no plan, then you're planning to fail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if, you're, if the idea is to start a business that you can take care of yourself, take care of your family, then you absolutely need to make sure you have the financial aspect of it covered and you also need to have the overall long-term implication 
of how and when you're going to either expand, contract, you know, looking for opportunities um, to either grow strategies, whether you're going to merge with other smaller companies or you're going to have partnerships and collaborations. And it's the same thing with the fun, you know, when you enter the space, even before you start, you need to, again, do your own market research, you know, on the weekend, go to the village, take the drive, get out of your car, talk to your neighbors, find out, you know, exactly what it is that they're looking for. I actually have a colleague of ours, Mustafa, he's an American, um, but uh, he's, a, he's an American married to a Burundian. And we actually met here in UG and we met up and we definitely hit it off. And I remember just talking to him, right? And part of the reason why he wanted to meet with Tina and I was the fact that where his restaurant is in Burundi mm -hmm. is in a town where the most highly sought after protein just happened to be pork. And the only pork that's available in our region is just the local grown you know, pig population, they don't have any um, enhanced breeds. So then he came to Uganda looking for better breeds. And then so after we sat down and we spoke, he's like, man, you know, you should definitely come out to Burundi. You know, you should consider the opportunities out there. Before I met with my friend Mustafa, mm -hmm. I, I didn't even consider Burundi, Burundi. as a potential partner. You used to think about no, it. No, no, no. I, I thought about it, but I didn't consider Burundi specifically for pork production. Yeah. I thought of Burundi as a potential manufacturing hub yeah. in the future for VF as we naturally expand to Rwanda and these other parts, you know, if the good Lord continues to bless us, right? Yeah. But I didn't think like, oh man, we should expand our pig our pigs project to Burundi. to Burundi until I met Mustafa. And so and directly, that was market research, yeah. right? And then his restaurant is doing tremendously well. Um, congratulations to you, my brother. I don't know if you're out here watching or you might discover this later, but that's how detailed you guys need to be because don't make the mistake. Mm -hmm. Can I just share with you guys, since I've been on the ground and I'm sure Tina can talk about this in depth, right? Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just, just starting this off and please chime in. The biggest mistake I know, one of the, one of many, but one of the most common mistakes people make in Uganda, I love you, my people here. I love you guys to death because I'm here. I'm riding it out with you here in the UG, okay? But when it comes to business, a lot of folks, they want the ready-made business. They want to come into the, to the, to the environment when everything is already perfect and they see you there let me tell you we were we were at a place called chanja mm -hmm. trust me this is all gonna come together mm -hmm. we were in a place called chanja we were looking to purchase uh, materials for plumbing right and we would we were literally waiting for everything to be purchased and loaded onto the vehicle mm -hmm. and i looked around i said tina look at this on one block how many how many hardware store did we count <laughs> There were, there were like three of them across the street across from each street. other yeah then on the street. one block there were probably like seven or eight hardware, hardware stores, stores yeah. and then another one that's so common here mm -hmm. you know most most young ladies you meet in kampala for those of you that are just <laughs> moving to uganda what's the number one business that they want to open tina Boutiques. They want to open clothing stores, yeah. boutiques. Those are for the slaves, of course. <laughs> so be careful about those. Mm. Um, but then the, the truth of the matter is people lack imagination, right? Mm. People literally just see you or somebody else doing something. And if that person seems successful, no matter how congested that field is, they're just going to jump in, right? But in reality, the truth of the matter is when it comes to farming, guys, and this is where we, this is, hopefully this will make sense to you. Mm -hmm. Just because Tina and I are running a mixed farm, it's because of the experience that we have and the research that we did. That's the path we chose to walk and follow. Particularly, it was heavily influenced by my background as a banker and Tina's corporate background in terms of understanding diversity, diversifying 
um, your holdings within the business place, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you may not have to do a mixed farm. If you want to do something mono, again, not what I would do, not what we preach, mm -hmm. but if that's what throws your boat, that's what you should do. Exactly. You know, if you want to grow crops, if that's where you see the money is, is, it could be made for you, do it. But it comes back to the point, the overall arcing point here. Don't worry so much about the market, okay? Mm -hmm. Because you're never going to know if a market exists unless you try, right? So I actually pointed out this to our friend Andrew, yeah. right? And, and I actually showed him the videos because we planted maize, actually lots of maize. We're going to update you guys update about this soon, right? Yeah. And we planted some maize and our maize were being decimated by what they call these rodents on this side. But in Ghana... They call them grass cutters, right? So that I'm telling my friend, I was like, hey, man, you know, this is a business here. Mm -hmm. And shout outs to the Ghanaian farmer um, because she's actually done a wonderful job featuring mm -hmm. this particular group of farmers in yeah. Ghana and West Africa who are grass cutter farmers, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I found, I pull up the video from the Ghanaian farmer's channel, okay? And I was like, yo, check this out. Does this look familiar to you? <laughs> he was like, oh, those are the rodents that always disturb us. <laughs> oh, <of course. laughs> okay? Yeah. Like when you first plant maize, yeah, the moment the maize roots. starts to grow, mm. they just come and destroy the roots. They remind me of gophers, but they're grass cutters. Mm. And I said, Andrew, do you realize this is a huge business in West Africa? Mm. You know? But nobody here in eastern Uganda... Like, like Eastern Africa, particularly in UG where we live, mm -hmm. no one is actually raising this animal as a, a potential business. They're, They're just there for free. <laughs> I mean, there's just a huge infestation everywhere you go, free grass cutters. The colonies are just there for the taking. But you know that there are few tribes that eat it. Which is, I'm sure they know how delicious the meat is. <laughs> yes, Kudos to those guys, <laughs> right? Where? Are they, are they in the south, the north? No. Oh, those are my people. Those guys are smart. But that's a business. That's a business. And and the reason I'm pointing this out, right, we had the same discussion about sheep. Yeah. We've had similar discussion about ducks, about duck egg production, about duck as a source of meat in the country of Uganda, mm -hmm. particularly sheep and duck. We're going to talk about those companies, th those farming ideas, right? Most people would automatically say, ah, there's no market in sheep. Duck farming, oh, please, there's no money to be made in duck farming. There's no market. For there's it. no market for it. And in reality, nothing could be further from the truth, right? What it comes down to is in Uganda here, it's not just Ugandans that are living here, okay? We have people that are coming from all over the globe, mm -hmm. all right? And let's face it, guys, unless you become Tyson Foods, or you become Conagra, or you become one of those mega conglomerate, even, even Tyson can't feed everybody in America, mm -hmm. right? You're not looking for three or 50 million customers. The idea when you put your business plan together, particularly when you're doing the marketing strategy aspect of that business plan, mm -hmm. you're just looking to get into 500 households. Yeah. And if you shoot for 500 households, and you find yourself in 200 to 150 households, these customers, if they are purchasing mm -hmm. from you consistently, that's all you need to attain. That's all the market share you're looking for as a mid, not even as a micro mm -hmm. to mid-sized farmer. And you can be, you could be doing extremely well financially, right? By simply carving out that market for yourself, right? Yeah. And believe me when I tell you guys, right now in Uganda, mm -hmm. when I go to the bank or when you're just driving around, I'm seeing a healthy population of Canadian folks that I'm interacting with. Yeah. I'm seeing a bunch of folks from the Netherlands, a bunch of folks from France, a ton of folks from even Denmark and, 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 and Switzerland even, right? A ton of folks from, from, from the uh, Asian part of the world, right? What does that tell you? You know, the country is becoming more diverse. The more diverse the country is, the more diverse diversity we need in terms of pilot offerings, right? Yeah. And so not everybody's going to be a pig farmer. Not everybody needs to sell goat. 
Not everybody needs to go into dairy. There are variations you can do, you know? The thing is, you need to figure out what it is that you like, what gets you excited about getting back to Mother Nature, and then you need to build your plan around that. And don't focus so much whether or not the market exists, because if you create it, okay, if you create that opportunity, your customer base is going to find you, especially if you're telling the world and your community at large that you exist, you'll be fine. That's, that's the word of advice I can give you guys. And you know what? There's so many of them here who have businesses. They have seen opportunities right here, mm -hmm. but they don't have some of the things that you know farmers can be able to supply to them. Mm -hmm. So if you get that chance that you can definitely start something of your own, this, the market is right there for you. And for people, of course, like you said in Uganda, we are more of followers than, you know, trendsetters. It's coming from a Uganda, so don't come <laughs> from me. <laughs> yes, we always love to follow what others are doing. So if you start something, do not get scared. As long as you have done your research properly and you, you know that there's at least a population that is going to, you know, get this from me, do it. Most people will definitely also try to copy what you're doing or follow you. And if, even if you're the first person, the first what should I say? If you're the, um, like, if you're the beginner, if you're the person who has started it first, most people will definitely consider you first as well. But also talking about starting a farm, you we talked about in the previous stream that ended mm -hmm. about someone starting. Start with what you have, even if you have, you know, five million, two million. Start with that as well. You can definitely start with that. Then you definitely grow with that amount of money. So I really wanted to also stress about buying land. Land appreciates. So for mm. people who are really delaying to buy land right now, I don't know what you guys are really waiting for because land prices everywhere we go to. It's getting out of control. It is getting out of control. And now with the development that we have in this country, especially in Uganda, because electricity is now going to rural areas, then also the water, the roads are being repaired. This is going to make land prices really very, very high. In fact, I was talking to one of my friends today, and they're looking for land somewhere <laughs> in Luero, that mm. other side. They didn't really expect the price they were telling them. Because, yeah, because they thought... like two years ago, they <laughs> thought they could buy an acre mm. for what, like 1500 to $2,000? Exactly. And now, how much was the average oh going for? God. Right now, average is from $10 million. Uganda so you're looking at what almost uh, three? It, it, it literally doubled in price in a year and a half. Yes. Yeah. That is like the price. So. Yeah. Nearly. In fact, and that's if you go deep. Deep in the village. <laughs> that's if you go yes, deep. Yes. Because she was even complaining. She was even asking me that. You know these places that we've really gone to. The brokers have taken mm -hmm. them to. These are really deep, deep in the villages. I'm telling you. I, I, it takes me back when we was looking for land in the beginning. Yeah. The one group of agents took us maybe two and a half hours away from civilization <laughs> to land. Do you remember that experience? <laughs> experience. To the point I'm where so Steve, we thought they, we thought they, they were gonna pull up. Uh, they were gonna kidnap us and just leave us out there because we kept on thinking there's no phone <laughs> signal. And that place you needed to drive like three hours away just to get to a cell tower. And then we and we had a colleague that was a broker, right? Mm -hmm. And then we're like, wait a minute. And I asked him, I said, so bro, a place like this, this far off the grid from life <laughs> and civilization, this is the kind of land you can get like two hundred dollars an acre, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we got out of the car, those guys were asking for ten million. Ten million for that land. For that land, like I literally, I was just stunned, mm -hmm. gobsmacked. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, what kind of world are we living in? But it's the same thing. It's not just the land, it's the price of animals. animals well. When this time, if the longer you take to get in the game, right, the stock just keeps going up, you know? And 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 that's why we don't want to happen to you guys because, you know, um, even, even in terms of equipment, it's getting more expensive. Even fencing materials oh my God, is everything. getting so much more expensive. Mm. So all the necessary tools that you need that's affordable today that can match your budget, you guys may end up pricing yourself out mm -hmm. by simply being idle and waiting. You know? Please continue. I have to just... <laughs> <laughs> 
So guys, it's never too late for you to, you know, start off your farms. That's what I really wanted to tell you guys. Yeah. But thank you guys. Please like the video. I know so many people are watching right now. 44 people watching. Please like the video so that it can be recommended to other people as well. We apologize for the last stream. That one I have to re apologize so much. So we have people watching us from Nairobi, Kenya. We have Robert who is saying, Hello VF, I really need a bow back from your heart. Keep up the good work. Thank you, thank you. Speaking of which, mm -hmm. announcement to be made here, live in, okay. in effect. Mm -hmm. So guys, as we speak, um, you know, so many of you have reached out to us on so many different occasions, just like Robert. Yeah. You guys want to get breeds from us. You guys want to get the pure goats that you see at our farm. We are also going to be upping the level, the amount of stock at VF on pure genetics, right? So myself and uh, potentially our friend in West Africa, Fred. Fred from Farming Africa, we may very well be taking a trip to South Africa together, but I'm not just gonna go to South Africa. You know, those of you that know anybody in Botswana, we're gonna be in Botswana, we're gonna be in South Africa. And the reason I'm going is because I feel that sector can definitely benefit from us finding and working with more reputable breeders because a lot of people have been importing goats, right? Uh, from, from different importers because Uganda is a big country and a lot of the breeds that have come in, right? Haven't been to the to satisfactory, yeah. right? And so we have a really good friend. His name is Rose from Rosemo Farms, Farms. Um, down there in South Africa. We're actually going to meet up with him. We're going to network with a bunch of professional breeders in South Africa. We're also going to cross over down to Botswana to, to, to network. And the reason I'm going to do this is because I want to make sure that if we're recommending importers coming to East Africa with these types of goats, that they are bred their their um uh what's the term i'm looking for they're certified uh um breeding stock right pedigree. because pedigree because not all goats are created equally you know um so i want to make sure that i meet these guys in person establish a real relationship do my own market research you see i'm following what i told you guys <laughs> right it applies no matter what you yeah, do in business, right? Ground. So I'm gonna go on. I'm gonna be on the ground. I'm gonna go press the flesh, meet these farmers, mm -hmm. um, spend some time on the ground, understand the process that they actually running, how they run their farm, in order for us to actually try to forge a partnership. Yeah. So that way we can actually order. So any of you that are interested in ordering pure boar goats of the highest quality. Right, the same thing I buy for you for us is what you guys can also purchase with our team, right? Mm -hmm. Because we need to be able to fill the crate so that we can get it from South Africa here to UG. So I'm waiting to get all the shipping info from my friend Rosmo, um, all the requirements in terms of quarantine and all this stuff, in order for us to go down there, make the best selection, right? And keep bringing breeder quality stock here into UG mm -hmm. so that we can continue to change the genetic makeup yeah. of our local goats here so that for you guys, it can become more affordable in the future when you want to enhance the breeds of goats that you guys want to keep. Wow, that is amazing. And same to the pigs as well. Yeah, we've been importing pigs from South Africa. We've been importing goats from South Africa, but this trip is gonna be specifically for boar goats. goats, yeah. If we can find Kalahari breeders, we're going to find them. If we can find folks who are doing the Blackberry Ghost, we're going to look for them. Um, pure Dopper Sheep, yeah, the Australian nice. Whites. You know, that's the next breeder goat I'm trying to get here, right? Okay. Um, white Doppers, you know. So we want to find certified breeders mm -hmm. that we can trust, and then we can start to import. And then, of course, continue to move the, 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 the genetic aspect of farming in east africa forward yeah yeah true. so wow edward was also saying the same thing he was like hi tin and grafton well done i see your animals looking great i need some i mean piglets and 
got. We have done. We have Thank you very much. Yes. So in case you're interested, you can always call us so that we can definitely arrange if you're in Uganda. It's much better so that we can definitely give you some of the breeds that we have at Value Farm. But thank you for appreciating and thank you so much for loving Value Farm as well. When we share these breeds with you guys, it really makes us happy. Absolutely. So, yeah. The best feeling is when we get a video from somebody with, so, with a happy customer, with their goats, with their pigs. Exactly. And when they have piglets and they send us the videos or just as they adjusting <laughs> to the farm. Adjusting to the farm. It's like well. the best feeling. But I got to I gotta say this, man. When you deal in livestock, mm -hmm. you know, it's so difficult not to get attached to those animals. That's how it it's is. It's so tough. I even have an extra male pig at the farm. And I know he's, he's great. You know? <laughs> he's great. But we've been offered so much money to sell to that sell pig. That pig yeah. I just can't do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not able to do it. Not yet anyway. You know? Not yet. But, you know. Yeah. Personal enjoyment is real. Yeah. Still I saying hello director and co-director. Hey. How are you doing? Hope doing you're great. doing great. Hope your weekend is going on so well so far and mm -hmm. you're catching up with VF, you know. Welcome. <laughs> For people who are really serious and they need farming, they're for going out <laughs> to party. <laughs> Especially my Ugandans. They don't be in the house. We they really might even be at the bar at the club right now getting that education. Busy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But we really appreciate you so much, guys. Someone is watching us from Duku Farm. Is watching from Nairobi, Kenya. Hello. I'll be in Kenya soon, too. Mm -hmm. We'll be all over. We're going to hit the road all over again. Yeah, that is true. Stella is watching us from the UAE. Great work. It's quite a motivating program. I'd love to get some bread from you in the near time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We shall definitely be grateful to give you some of the breeds from Value Farm. And of course, it's really a pleasure for all people who have purchased something from us, sharing with us. There's a lady who purchased some piglets from us. I think I yeah, talked about the other last day. time. Yeah. yeah, she shared with us some of the clips of the housing mm -hmm. she's doing currently. It's like a temporal one, simple mm -hmm. yeah. and basic. But, you know, she's really very happy and excited to see how the pigs are. And of course, with the advice we gave about separating them mm -hmm. according to the sizes as well, yeah. she followed it. So she was giving They're me the okay steps. Now, right? Exactly. She was giving us the steps on how she's dividing the rooms, how they're being comfortable now, hey, adapting to the I see you have a friend from the TNG. TNG? Who's that? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I don't know who this is. I, where, where is this? Namataba. Is that in Namataba. Uganda? Yes, that is in Namataba. Where, where is that? Is that northern or western? No, no, no. It should be in eastern, if I'm not mistaken. Paul from Nigeria. Oh, that is Namataba. That is Mason. Imi. Oh, Mason. Yes. Hey, <laughs> my brother's on the ground. Yeah. Welcome, Mason. Mason, how are you doing? Thank you for watching. Welcome, for welcome, you. welcome. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's another young brother that is officially uh, migrated from the U.S. Mm -hmm. Case in point, he's here in UG on the motherland here in Africa, but particularly chose to, to come to East Africa. Yeah. And he's here in Kampala, you know, looking for his opportunity. I'm sure he has a good plan. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely have to catch up. Catch up yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, welcome to Kampala. Welcome to UG. And um, you have Tina here, you have me, you know, and you have, I'm sure you've already made some connections mm -hmm. on the ground. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, guys, it's so encouraging mm -hmm. to see other fellow brethren coming from the diaspora, right? Making the, the trip back and not just coming to have fun, but coming to open businesses, coming to explore opportunities, come in to just, you know, see what's on the ground, you know? Um, no matter what you do, right? It's, it's so rewarding to just bump into other fellas from America, from the UK, from, you know, Jamaica. I actually had a really nice conversation with our ice cream friend mm. from the oh Bahamas, really? you know? 
like we spoke for almost like three hours. Yeah. And 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 he's also coming in for a visit because he's interested in ice cream manufacturing here mm -hmm. um, in UG. So the opportunities are plenty, mm -hmm. you know, and don't be deterred by people's negativity. Let me tell you something. Most people in this life will always, always mm -hmm. try to be the the devil on your left shoulder trying to tell you not to pursue your dream, not to give it your all, to just stay idle and watch life, you know, from the window on your balcony. But in reality, you have to get in the game. You have to take risks. Life is about risk taking. Yeah. And if you're going to live most of your life in a glass, you know, glass house where you're just afraid of your own shadow, chances are you're going to live a very mundane and unfulfilled life because by the time our our I would say prime of our life you know has been you know spent you want to look back and see it and feel that you you lived that you you you've seen places you've done things and of course economics is always a factor you know and I know a lot of us are just very comfortable being employees and that's okay. Mm -hmm. You can still live a very fulfilled life. At least get on the plane when you have your vacation. You know, go see a place outside of your own state, mm -hmm. outside of your own city. I'm from New York City, y'all. So many of my friends, New Yorkers, mm -hmm. and you guys know where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. They have never been out of the state of New York. And this is New York. And when I first got transferred, when I was working for Wachovia Securities from New York City to Maryland, I met so many folks in Maryland, and it was the same thing. They 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 were born in Maryland. They might have gone to University of Maryland or somewhere within the state of Maryland, but never have left the state of Maryland to even visit Pennsylvania, New York, nothing. And these are all places you can get to on a bus, in a car, nothing. So when it comes to business, when it comes to you stepping out of your shell and your comfort zone, listen, there's a reason this world has billionaires, right? And trillionaires. And then we have folks that will always be laborers forever. Yeah. And then the biggest difference, obviously, yes, some, a lot of these folks were started out life with economic advantages. But there's a lot of self-made billionaires out there, you know? And most of them made their billions through farming. <laughs> a good portion also made their billions through tech, right? So farming is not a new tech. I'm sorry. I know it's an oxymoron, but the unicorns are being born, right? The new chain of billionaires that are being created every single you know, seemingly every other week now, right? It's happening in farming, mm -hmm. right? Agriculture. You know, not saying you have to get your hands dirty. There's a very large chain within the ag world, right? Mm -hmm. But this is the new place to make it, True. you know? It's not new. It's just been overlooked by a lot of our people. But a lot of people, you know, in the U.S., in Europe, the Netherlands, all over the globe, Germany, they understood the value of agriculture. Sure. And many billionaires have been forged within that stream. Wow. What? You know what Hassan is saying? He's what? saying he's already loving it here. And the videos are really encouraging him so much. Nice, nice. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate Thank the support. You. You're welcome to the continent. You're welcome to Uganda in particular. And of course, I know everything is going to be good for you right here. <laughs> I know we've talked before, but you know. This is just the beginning, and at least with all these videos, because he used to watch our videos even when he was oh, back yeah? in the US here. Yeah. So thank you so much. Someone is saying here, yeah, Tiffany is saying in the process of setting my house. I just saw that Vegas. message too. Yeah. Yes, and moving to the continent was planning to Ghana, on Ghana, but the guys definitely have me thinking about Uganda. Nice, my uh, Tiffany. <laughs> you should definitely take the trip both to the west and the east. But I will tell you, you should 100% consider all factors. Mm -hmm. It depends on what you want to do, right? Go with whatever your research tells you to do. And you visiting the UG is part of research, you understand? 
as part of research. You're going to come here, network with some people, and then, you know, try it on, you know, see how it feels. I can tell you from my personal experience, the weather here on the east is definitely more to my liking. Mm -hmm. it's, but then you be from Barbados, mm -hmm. the west might be more to your liking because it's very <laughs> similar weather, more right? Similar weather. That's um, nice. But then overall, as long as you're coming back to the motherland and you come back with a plan and you come back on this side, discipline. You know, you got to keep the blinders on, stay focused. Forget partying, forget just being idle, forget just trying to be a baller. You come here, you be frugal with your money. You be, you know, what's the, what's the saying? You could, do a, you could do a lot more learning from your ears than your eyes, right? You just be a sponge, you listen, you, 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 you follow, you know, the right group of people, join the right networks, okay? Mm -hmm. And then when you're ready, like a jumping spider, you just strike. <laughs> <laughs> you just strike out of the blue don't let them see you coming you know no it's true and that's how you're gonna make it just, you know you take your time you watch everything, everything. you 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 know you listen you know and then when you're ready you make your move mm, you're still saying there's a Barbados embassy in Ghana yeah okay the main reason I was considering Ghana Barbados is awesome but is in the top of the most expensive countries in the world. Yeah. Have you been to Barbados? Of course. Barbados, I mean, my Bayesian people, that, true story. Mm -hmm. I'm a foodie, guys. One of my true. best friends, his name was Mike, first Bayesian I ever met. Mm -hmm. The best jerk chicken. I know a lot of Jamaicans are going to come for me, mm -hmm. but the best jerk chicken I ever had was actually cooked by my friend Mark, Mike from my church, New York City Church of Christ. You know, shout out to you guys, you know, was cooked by my friend Mike okay. from what, I mean, like the best. So yeah, I've been there several times good. and good people, very smart. Um, and you know, this style of cooking is just, is again, it's very similar to the type of food that I make. Okay. So Caribbean. We, of course, they are they are part of the Caribbean. Okay. You know, good food, wonderful people, um, great rums come out of Bar um, Bar Barbados. You know, all good. So you'll be right at home here in UG if you decide to come this side. You know. Mm -hmm. And of course, we also have different kinds of food in Uganda that you can try as well. Yeah. Food, how are you adapting to the Ugandan food? You know, actually, I found myself now, I, I like the local food now. Uh, not, I shouldn't say all of it, right? Because some of it is just tough for me. You know, like I'm not a fan of Porsche. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. This is the cornmeal. I can't Why? do the cornmeal the way you guys do it here. Now, if the cornmeal they cook in Barbados, that they cook in the DR or even in Haiti or in Jamaica, mm -hmm. it's done very differently. How? Because the way you guys make the cornmeal here, they don't put nothing in it. There's no salt, there's no butter, there's nothing. But then when you go to the Caribbean, that same cornmeal is usually made with coconut, with some beans, right? But then the way they make it, like the beans is made into like an authentic bean sauce, the way that I usually like to have mine. And then sometimes they put coconut in it, like it's different. But in Uganda, the Porsche, man, it is so real. Done. Like it's legitimately just take the cornmeal, add water, and then go. So Ugandan, how do you say uh -huh. that you add salt? I understand, Porsche? but you have to understand. That's what I'm saying. Oh. But that's the beauty, and <laughs> that's the beauty and the difference, right? That's the beauty and the difference, and it's the same way. Like the matoke that you guys love here, yeah. right? For me, I love my Puerto Rican people and the Puerto Ricans, you know, cuisine that I grew up with in New York City, you know, and Harlem, you know, parts of Brooklyn. I've been to Puerto Rico like I could, Puerto Rico like a zillion times. I'm a big fan of mofongo. You've never heard of mofongo for the most part, right? You've told us how I explained it to you, but you've never experienced it. Yeah. So for me, I'm used to eating my plantain, you know, or the matoke you guys have here, mm -hmm. I'm used to eating mofongo, where the meat is there, you know, where you either have your shredded pork 
or chicken or whatever they want to put in there, I'm accustomed to that. However, I've become the champion of eating the Ugandan rice and beans. <laughs> Tina, you can, chapati. Uh, chapati. It's a <laughs> I'm a huge fan of the chapati. I'm a huge fan of the rice, the beans, um, even the grilled goat, the yeah. grilled chicken, the chicken, right? So I've, I've adjusted very well. It took a while, but you know, look, Shaka Zulu is one of my favorite local restaurants here in Uganda. That is true. And you know, I'm being, I'm being real. I can't fake the funk on that. Mm -hmm. That is so, so true. Yeah. And our version of the Ugandan beans, at least you try. I love it. Yeah. I love it. In that fact, that's what I, I be, I'm almost a vegan. That's not true story. I can eat the Ugandan local beans with rice. Two times a day, you know, and I did it for months because mm -hmm. that was the only thing I was able to eat initially. And so, it is so strange that you love the dried beans. I love the dry beans. The fresh beans. Yet you can as prefer the fresh beans. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, the dry beans have more flavor to me. Strange, <laughs> strange. How did we get off topic? <laughs> what off topic? You're talking I don't know. about food. Are you talking about no, food? we're talking about the Caribbean mm -hmm. because of Tiffany. I think it's from Barbados. That's mm -hmm. why. So, cabinet was saying, you guys need to start. I need to start pig farming. What are the challenges in pig farming? Please educate me a little bit of it. Well, you come to the right place. Just look for many videos we've done on this channel. But to give you the brief elevator pitch when it comes to pig farming, the biggest challenge you're going to have, feeds, let me think. Oh, yeah, feeds. feeds number one. And then number, okay, feeds. <laughs> so <laughs> if you prepare yourself, yeah. you get the right genetics, and you actually prepare your feeds before you start, mm. then getting into pig farming is going to be a very smooth transition. Yeah. The number one mistake most people make in that field they come, they can't wait, they buy all the beautiful, cute little piglets. They don't even know how to mix the feed properly. They don't know the feeding formulas. And then before you know it, they're calling you, well, how come your pigs, my pigs that I got from you are not looking the way they look on your, your channel or at your farm? Simple, feeds, genetics, feeds and genetics go hand in hand. So if you're gonna get into that business, you know, you need, to, if you don't have a lot of land, look to lease additional land for you to plant your maize, so soybeans, sunflower, whichever source of protein you want to use to drop that cost down, then you're going to have a wonderful time getting into the pigs business. But if you don't do it that way, if you enter and you buy like 30 pigs and you think you're going to buy maize brand every other week or every two weeks, as you continue to scale up as a commercial farmer, yeah. then pig farming is not, you're not going to find it enjoyable. Is it profitable? Absolutely. Particularly if you run the business the way it's supposed to be run. That is true. And overstocking is not advisable in the beginning. If you're a beginner farmer, start with at least a few of them. Then you can learn from them, experience from them, then you can definitely add on. That is the best way that you can do. Then also about housing, if you're starting a pig farm, start basic. Do not kill yourself going for something too fancy and very expensive that you're not going to manage or sometimes you can be having your money but still it's better for you to start something basic then definitely grow and also get it better as long as the structure is well designed enough space for your animals as well you're good to go so those are some of the things that you need to take note of as you're starting especially in the beginning yeah yeah Structure is important. Access to water is extremely water. important. Oh my God. Particularly clean water. Clean water, yes. But make no mistakes about it. You can have the best water, the best feed combo. If you make the mistake of going cheap on the genetics, you're going to find yourself really hating pig true. farming. Because you're not going to get anything out of it except for agita. That is so true. <laughs> <laughs> so food, water, structure... Genetics, number one, first, of course, with the, with the feeds. That's what you should really get to know about it. So the challenges when you get into it, of course, there's so many challenges even with management. As long as you have people who, are, who know what to do, you train them, or even you yourself, in case you get into it, at least get some knowledge about how you're going to take care of these pigs because you can't just jump into pig farming 
without getting more knowledge on how you work. Guys, just business. watch the videos on this channel. Yeah. All that information is free. If you want any additional details, then you can schedule a consultation mm -hmm. um, for us to answer more in-depth questions for you. And, you know, we'll answer all the questions you have on that particular subject and help guide you if you feel like you need additional hand-holding. Exactly. But for the most part, the info is here. It's free. You know, enjoy. Educate yourself so you can definitely have a better chance of success, right? Yeah, that's true. So Samson is saying, hello good people, if I want to move there from Canada, how much money would be enough? Samson, that's a tricky question because it depends on on what you want to do, right? Because like, if you're trying to come to Uganda and live in Kololo, which is the Rodeo <laughs> Drive or Beverly Hills of Uganda, then I will tell you you need to come with at least a couple hundred thousand. But if your idea is to come to Uganda and retire or to come to UG and live like a normal person, then, you know, 25, 30,000 is more than enough to leave, you know, Canada to come on a different continent and actually set up your life. Again, I'm not quite sure what your profession is, what you're trying to do. So it's a really tricky question for us to try to exactly. answer. But you know, just plan to give yourself enough of a financial cushion so that you can be here for at least two years of savings, right? Because whatever business you start may take a little bit of time. Um, so you definitely want to have that cushion as a contingency. You know, you may, I may say bring 25 to 30K, but realistically the first year or two, the first year you're here, you might only spend like 10,000 or less, you know? But I'm a very conservative person when it comes to finances. So I'm always going to, you know, to lean to the to the more cushion side of it in case, you know, you face the worst, you can weather the storm. But, you know, you need to figure out exactly what you want to do, because if you come in here to start a farm, you're going to have to find land. You're going to have to have shelter. Yeah. You're going to have to build infrastructure from scratch. So it all depends on exactly what you're looking to do here. That's why it's going to determine how much money you're going to need. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. And of course, you need to just visit at least and see, and also weigh options so that you can prepare yourself better when you're, you're coming back maybe next time. Just come and visit. Yeah, us. we always urge for people to visit, mm. to check, you know, but some of us Want to come. are just ready to come, you know. And, and as long as your expectations are set accordingly, you know, um, you, you can definitely make some moves. So that's, that's, that's all I have for that. Wow. Guys, what are you up to? Give your, leave your comments down below. We are here to answer your questions today. So if you have your questions, guys, drop them down here because we need to answer them as much as we can. What's the time? Oh my God, it's midnight. But also, guys, like the video. We have 55 people in the, in the chat. Please just like the video as well so that it can be recommended to other people. But we appreciate you guys so much for loving us, for always being here, watching our live streams, watching our videos, loving our social media platforms. You guys are amazing. We really appreciate you guys. Stella was saying that's great. UG food is rich in vitamins. Yeah. UG foods, if you come to Uganda, if it's more organic, that's what you have to know. <laughs> so at least you definitely enjoy the food here because it's more organic, it's more natural. So for people who have really visited, by the way, Misan, we had lunch with them together one time mm. and he enjoyed the Ugandan food. He said he nice. likes it yeah, already. <laughs> that's so, a man on a mission. Yes, he's really adopting. <laughs> he's serious about yeah. everything here. But that is really that, guys. We really appreciate you guys. We're waiting for your questions as as we want to hear from you guys. Thank you so much for the advice. Just say it. it's midnight. It's 5.45 here in Barbados. Barbados. Wow. People in the Caribbean are watching. People in the Caribbean have, man, Caribbean food. You know, the irony there, right? Mm -hmm. Caribbean food is really African food. It's African food. And... But it's amazing, but though. But it's quite different. It's ah, no, not necessarily, because it depends on which part of Africa you're in, mm. right? Because if you're in the Caribbean, 
and I'm sure the people who are watching this rebroadcast or watching live can attest to this. If you're from the Caribbean, right, and you watch people from Nigeria, from Ghana, from Senegal cook, mm -hmm. they're cooking Caribbean food. Basically, the Caribbean folks have been cooking mm -hmm. African food. Seriously, even like food from Ethiopia, which has a rich culinary, you know, history and some great dishes and, 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 and the food culture in Ethiopia is quite, you know, remarkable, right? But even from the east stretching to the west, but particularly when you watch Senegalese cooking, mm -hmm. Sierra Leone yeah, cooking, good. you watching, it's like you watching somebody in Jamaica or Haiti or Trinidad and Tobago cooking. You know, so yeah, if, if you're accustomed to eating Caribbean cuisine, then adjusting to the African way of cooking, you know, especially West Africa. West Africa. East yeah? Africa, we especially, are quite different. <laughs> especially West Africa, then the adjustment is going to be very easy for you. You know, make. the thing, the difference is in Uganda, we do not like the spicy food. Sometimes much. you don't like it. A lot, the exposure. <laughs> Because then now you're being a hypocrite, right? <laughs> I'm calling you out. You see, the exposure no. to the Caribbean style of style cuisine is not here in Uganda. Yeah. However, most Ugandans that experience that Caribbean style cuisine, after a while, End up like can't live without it. You know, it's, even you. Yeah. <laughs> Miss, I can't eat pepper. I can't eat nothing spicy. And now all of a sudden when you cooking, right? If you don't have the good seasoning, right? Because before, when I first came to Uganda, Tina used four things to cook. Royco, wow. which is free advertising, wow. right? Onions, <laughs> tomatoes, green pepper. That was it. Maybe a pinch of salt. So call that five. But now Tina is a master chef. She liked the Thank Caribbean you. cuisine flavors. Thank you for exposing me. <laughs> you deserve to be exposed. But the fun fact is, Ugandans, we don't really eat so much of the spicy food. We like our food really natural. And more, even the boiled stuff. So the food Let me tell you guys, we were in Western Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I have to tell the story. When you get to Western Uganda, the pride, I love my people. Mm -hmm. The way they tell you, oh, it's boiled. It's almost, <laughs> <laughs> see that? It's almost like they're telling you, we're such bigger. <laughs> it's such, what do you mean? How dare you think about fried food here? What we have here is boiled. Boiled food. No, but it's the way they pronounce it. Mm. The emphasis. Mm. No, it's boiled. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever watch Sanfell, no, no grease for you in Western Uganda, you know, that, that would explain why they're in such great shape. Yeah, sure. Most of these guys on, on, on the West, they're lean, they have their six pack, because mm -hmm. all the food is boiled. Even in the central, like we love it boiled food. Tina, especially boiled. some of these restaurants won't even give you the option of frying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and if they do fry, they do it on a down low. They don't even <laughs> want to put it up. Because <laughs> you got some fried chicken. I ended up with the boiled food. <laughs> but it was nice, right? Uh, do you know why we even boiled the food most of the time? Because we first roast it a little bit, especially uh, like the beef and the chicken. We put it on fire, smoke it a little bit, then we boil it. So it's has the aroma, it has the taste that we really love. <laughs> so when you come to Uganda, be ready to eat some of that food. And my fellow Ugandans, I know you know what I'm talking about. The boiled stuff is nice. It's very tasty, by the way. Thanks, Mr. Positive. Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is busy. Yo, Henry, he's saying, oh, he's sorry, missed the 50 minutes. Oh, sorry about that. I know you'll definitely re-watch the video. I got you. Thanks for giving me on, an honest answer. I'll consider visiting, get some sort of business idea. My Wakanda fans, we are, where are you located in the USA? Me? I don't know. My Wakanda fans, where are you located in the USA? I think someone commented somewhere. Uh, well, I'm originally from, I would say, 
New York City is my is is the is the home mm-hmm. I would claim, but I also lived all over the U.S. Um, AZ, Maryland, D.C., Virginia, mm-hmm. um, California. Uh, but no, Brooklyn. That's that's the Brooklyn accent here. Mm-hmm. I can't shake it even if I want to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Tiffany saying you guys eat snails in Uganda. No. Actually, that's another big business. That's a no, that's the thing. And and this is the thing too, right? That's these are again opportunities that exist. I like to share this story about duck eggs, guys. When I first started working with Tina on the ground here in Uganda, and even when we were starting to put our plan together as far as the type of farm that we wanted to open, I've always had a strong affinity to do duck farming right yeah i always wanted to get ducks i always wanted to get sheep you know i always wanted to get goats right Mm -hmm. and i remember like trying to convince tina like expressing to both tina and our friend yasin like hey duck farming is big business Mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of folks in this country that definitely would love some some duck meat and including duck eggs because most of Europe, most parts of Europe mm. use duck eggs to, for most baking yeah. and, and for eating. Because the duck eggs itself is more nutritionally rich than the chicken eggs. I think it's at least like it's like 1.3 or 1.5% more. Literally one duck egg is almost twice the size yeah. of a standard chicken egg, right? But then in terms of nutritional value, the bigger yolk sac, um, you know, more protein. Mm. And so Tina was not hearing. She couldn't even fathom eating duck eggs. Like all true friends, yeah. I had cooked some duck eggs and we were going on some road trip somewhere and I actually brought some for me, right? Cause I, you know, listen guys, we always on the move. So I brought some just in case I got hungry and I had it in the car. And then of course, when we had a chance to stop, you know, I'm eating my uh, eggs, you know, and this one here, you know, I was like, hey, do you want to try some? She tried the duck eggs, and now, between chicken eggs or duck eggs, which one do you prefer, Madam Tina? <laughs> the duck eggs. Mmm, and why is that? They're quite tasty. <laughs> but, oh, but before you tried it, before you tried it... I never thought about trying it because of, I think how people in Uganda perceive about duck eggs and it wasn't just common. I wasn't exposed to it before. It's the same thing with snails, right? Mm -hmm. So snails is a big business in West Africa. Africa. Snail snail farming is so huge in in, in West Africa. They're even exporting processed snail frozen to the U.S. Wow. Okay, to the U.K. And these guys can't raise enough snails to meet the demand, right? That's number one. So here in East Africa, in fact, do you remember when we were in Bukaya? We saw the biggest snail. Those are the snails people eat. Yes. Yes. They eat them in Spain. They eat them in in the UK. They eat them in France. And, And in fact, you guys should also know snail caviar is a thing. There are people making millions of dollars, you know, in Spain, right? Breeding snails Mm -hmm. and collecting the eggs Mm -hmm. and they're packaging it as caviar and they're making millions of dollars from snail caviar. So there's a business out there. Most people just have to take the chance and, and, and test the waters. You know, the customers exist. You know, but you have to have something to offer, mm. you know? Hi, William. Yes. William is in the chat, by the way. Oh, hi, William. Mm. You know what was surprising one time? Because mm-hmm. I was scrolling through TikTok. Mm-hmm. A Ugandan was teaching in Uganda mm-hmm. how to prepare a snail. I was in shock. But you yeah. should have seen the comments. People were like, oh, what? How Just like, this- you know, you're right. Just like the grass cutters, it's a huge market for it. In West Africa, right? Mm-hmm. But they're here. No one is harvesting them. No one is. Harvesting. So if you the actually, there's one Ugandan snail farmer. 
she's actually into the beauty industry. Yeah. And I actually saw a really nice feature on Kinganda mm -hmm. about this particular lady. And she started snail farming, I think like three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. And she's actually, uh, she makes a variety of natural hair products, mm -hmm. beauty products. And now I think the idea was to actually process the snail slime so that she can export overseas, right? There's a lot of money to be made in that, in that particular That's business. True. You know, most people are just uneducated about the opportunities that exist within the space. And that's why you, that's why we're here. We're here to shed light and, 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 and try to provide insight on, on all things farming, particularly when it comes to what we do as mixed farmers. Yeah, I remember the time I went to Dr. Nalima's farm. Mm -hmm. They had a small project for the snails. Mm -hmm. So the person who was just taking us around asked him why they had the snails there. They're like, oh my God. It's this a big business. It's a real biz big business. Like a few years ago, they used to sell out all the time mm -hmm. and they had their market. I was in shock. It mm -hmm. was my first time seeing like a project mm -hmm. where snail farming was really And they're hard. very easy to, to, to raise. Mm -hmm. Very easy to raise. I think they very fast. They lay. They lay a ton of eggs, but it, but the the like all things, you just have to educate yourself yes, about so the business. Yes. You know how to manage them, how to raise them, care for them, mm -hmm. and you'll be good to go. Okay. So Tiffany is planning on snail farming in Ghana. Which so, one? Tiffany. Who's Tiffany? Oh, is that what she's trying to do? Yeah, that's what she's trying to do. Yeah. Tiffany. See. Mm -hmm. You'll have much success there, my sister. Okay, is there a market for snail farming? Is that price, especially in Yes, there is. You just have to, to foster that relationship. Mm -hmm. Because, Tina, how many how many Nigerians would you say are currently living in Uganda now? There are quite a number. So many of them. And do you know... And so many are coming to Uganda. And, and guess what, though? Do you know how many of our Nigerian brothers and sisters that actually live for snails? A great deal of them. A lot of Ghanaians, a lot of Nigerians, just West Africa as a whole. Snail farming is just like eating chicken, you know? And 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 that, again, the opportunity exists, mm -hmm. right? Low entry point into that business, you know? But most people will rather wait for someone to do that business first and do it on a big scale, and then they're going to want to jump in, you know? Yeah. But no, the opportunity exists here in East Africa. The market is there. You just have to satisfy it. Once you have the product, the customers will find <laughs> you. Will find you. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. I think, no, I, I think, I think no, it's true. I think, true story, I was speaking to one of our colleagues in the village, right? Mm -hmm. And this is when we were looking into getting into, like, avocados and other fruit, you know, other types of fruits. Yeah. And then he had a ton of, um, if I'm, of mangoes. At his farm mm. and so i asked him so how do you find the market <laughs> and i swear to the good lord mm. this man said verbatim the following mm. ah you know i planted my mango <laughs> trees and then by the time they were mature even before they were ready people started coming to my farm <laughs> booking the trees mm. ah, i'm taking these tinch mango trees here you know here's a deposit and it's the same thing you know you have to be your own advocate you have to talk to people but believe me, we're in a country where, you know, a lot of folks are migrating from Nigeria, Ghana, Ghana. Senegal. They're coming here to UG. Mm -hmm. We have a ton of students that are coming here so to attend the great Macare University. Mm -hmm. And they're finding themselves liking it here yeah. in Uganda. And they're staying, mm -hmm. you know. And just because you leave, you know, Nigeria don't mean your palate changes, right? Yeah. Sometimes you're going to want a taste of home. And sometimes your brother needs to eat some snails. That's true. And so it's, it, it, you know, why should they have to, to send it from Nigeria to Uganda? <laughs> By the way, in Kansanga, uh -huh. that is, I think even what the Maya featured this about a certain area in suburb in uh -huh. Kampala, it's Kansanga, where there are so many international people, yeah. especially from West Africa. Yes. There are so many restaurants from West, yeah. Western African people yeah. cooking West African dishes. And guess what? Those are your customers. Those are the customers. And of course, those are the people who will definitely buy. They'll buy and from most you. students are right here in Uganda. People mm -hmm. who are coming to do business, I think people have seen opportunities right mm -hmm. here. There are so many people from West 
West Africa coming to Uganda, Kenya, you know, to do business. So that can be your market as well. But as for Ugandans, Ugandans, we shall definitely learn. I think it's about learning how to eat it, like how we force people to learn. We how to just eat need Russell people Pass. like Tiffany to come to Uganda, <laughs> set up a snare farm here in Uganda, uh -huh. and show us the way. There would be no competition, okay? Mm -hmm. Show us the way, Tiffany. Come, and our friend here, Gigi, is asking us to come to the DRC. Oh. I would love to go. <laughs> I hear the roads are suspect, but I would love to fly to Kinshasa. And would love to meet the coffee lady yeah. that was featured yeah. on Water Myers channel. Mm. And I would love to come to the DRC to rub elbows with my fellow brothers and sisters out there in the Congo, where they speak the best French, French yeah. in all of Africa, in my humble opinion. But don't come for me, guys. You know, one of the best French speaking countries in Africa is the DRC. You may like the weather in the DRC. We have the same weather as in Uganda. I love the Ugandan weather. And at first, I was not convinced. Mm -hmm. I was not convinced. But being here in UG is just like being in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. It's just like being in Trinidad and Tobago. You get your rainy season. You might even get your hurricane season here. Yeah. But here, there's no real hurricanes. You just get mm -hmm. some, some minor flooding, you know, from too much rain. Mm -hmm. But then apart from that, very low humidity. It's nice and cool, mm -hmm. doesn't get too cool, doesn't get too hot. I mean, my word, mm -hmm. if you're a farmer, you can't live anywhere better than Uganda. Yeah, that is true. Chick Chick Family Farm, Guyana, is one of one of our good followers. Guyana in the house. Let me I tell you, Guyana is great. Yeah, I think he's a rabbit farmer. Nice. Thank you so much, Chick Chick Family Farm. Mm. welcome <laughs> thank you so much you've been a good follower he's always in our premieres our streams thank you so much much love to you then ali is saying thank you guys so much for this informative information i mean very informative thank you you all have a relationship with makera university college of veterinary medicine animal resources and biosecurity actually we want to establish that relationship particularly since our our facilities are almost ready yeah. to be taking interns, to be taking, you know, students from McCary University Veterinary Cert, um, um, Division as the attachment. Mm -hmm. um, but we're really looking forward to establishing that relationship for sure. I'm, I'm looking forward to that because, you know, McCary is a fantastic yeah. educational institution and we would definitely love to partner with them. That's in true. that capacity because our farm I think would definitely meet the standard of McCary University and vice versa. Most of them have already reached out to us, you know that. Yeah. Most but, of them watch our videos, like the lecturers, people from there already. And of course that's your alma mater. Many people know that's where <laughs> that's why so hear, you guys them. hear this fancy English accent here? Mm -hmm. The perfect English, she attended McCary University. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, but most of them have really reached out to us as well. But mm -hmm. we shall definitely work with them very when everything is settled and you know worked out properly. So we shall definitely work hey, with a better relationship. Um, Aaron, great question. Mm. I love guinea fowl. That's another great business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Guys, we're sleeping on opportunities. Mm -hmm. Guinea fowl to me, right? Yeah. If I had the chance to do just poultry, like standard chicken and, you know, the different level of birds that we have in Uganda. Yes. Quail and guinea fowl, two tremendous opportunities here mm -hmm. in Uganda. There's no, there's no competition. But the funny thing is, I'm being honest. Yeah. When you are, you see these guys from Busia mm -hmm. on the side of the road Eastern set in Eastern Uganda selling a guinea fowl, they're going to charge you like $40 for one freaking bird. Yeah. And for the pay, you're going to spend like $80 to $100, right? So yeah, I don't know why we don't have large-scale guinea fowl farmers in Uganda. I, at some point, once we get everything stabilized at UG, I mean um, at VF, you know, I would love if we can get a couple hundred guinea fowls. Yeah. The meat is incredible. 
and they're very hardy birds. Yeah. And by having those birds at your farm, especially if you let them free range, part of the time, they will take care of all your tick issues. They are the, the most important. In fact, our tick numbers went up when our guinea files went away. Yeah, but we have a few. We, we have, have a few. The, the comeback is bad. Uh, the for the comeback. <laughs> but we need at least a hundred yeah. at the farm. Yeah. yeah. And you know what is very interesting with the guinea fowls and the quails? We do have them in the wild. A bunch of them. A bunch of them. Whenever we go to the farm, most they're just times, strolling. They're just. They the just. Tail. They're teasing me. <laughs> <laughs> Grafton tries to get them to hunt you for know, them. You know what? But it's I need no, the best people for that for to come settle the score for me. Mm -hmm. Or my Jamaican brothers, or my Trinidadian brothers. Mm -hmm. Anyone from the Caribbean mm -hmm. can come here, you know, True. with the fresh knowledge. They'll trap those birds all day, or yeah. they will be eating guinea fowls. We have so many of them. They just like yeah. to taunt us. Yeah. There are hundreds just roaming free. That is true. Yeah. And the thing is, because they are the wild ones, then we have the domestic, the domestic domesticated ones. ones. Yeah, exactly. From the farm, sometimes it can be a challenge. This one can be tricked. To go to the wild so that's how some of ours disappeared but we still have a few of them at the farm but definitely that business we have there's a lady that featured one time on tv mm -hmm. she was doing more of the guinea fowls in northern it's uganda it's a huge business it's a huge business business and yeah. it's very expensive yeah a to pair. get those birds it's yes. like don't you remember a pair of the regular ones are 350 Three, to 400,000. Yeah, 400,000. yeah and if you get the white ones the white ones could be like oh two fifty to three hundred thousand each. Yes. So yeah, it's a wonderful business. And it's a great business in Busia, then also all the over. Western part yeah. of Kenya. Yeah. They have a lot of a them. A lot of them. Yeah. And it's delicious. Yeah. Have you ever had guinea fowl meat? No. It's incredible. It's like the local chicken, but better. That's what they say, but I've never it's, tried it's it. It's a fact. Okay, guinea fowl eggs test good. Although you see, Williams, much right? Smaller. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Same thing. Quail eggs are tiny, but they're also delicious. Yeah. Marshall is saying, I have been following you since last year. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Kamara is saying, joining a little late. Sorry, I've missed, but I hope I will still find that info. You definitely find there. that yeah. information there. Then you've read that one from Aaron. I love going to Uganda. That is the golden eye jack. Thank you. Hope you can definitely come back if you're visiting all the time. Come and sit and do some business right here. Come and join the farming, you know, farming sector. We are always calling people to come and join us so that we can solve the food security in our country and also everywhere all over the world. Because with the processing and exporting from, you know, from Uganda to other countries, it's going to be better for other people to benefit from us farmers. So Please join the family, join us. And guys, for the record, there's not just Uganda. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of opportunities in Burundi, mm -hmm. a ton of opportunities in Rwanda, a ton of opportunity in TZ, right? Mm -hmm. But for me, I just love being in Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you love Uganda, Drafter? I, apart from the traffic in the border, guys, in Kampala, mm -hmm. Uganda is a very beautiful country and and you know initially I have to be honest when I first got here mm -hmm. I used to always hear people say that especially local Ugandans are so proud about how beautiful Uganda is as a country right mm -hmm. but it wasn't until like we started leaving Kampala started headed towards the western part of the country even our recent trip down to it is it, Sunjuru, what is it? Sinjuru. It's Sinjuru. Mm -hmm. Where we went out there on that side to actually meet up with a, a colleague of ours, a good friend of ours, Mark. Um, that's when you really see the beauty, the beauty of Uganda. Like I've been to almost every part of Uganda except for Northern Uganda, Northern Uganda and I have not yet been to the West Nile region. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, I've been to the south, I'm here in the central. We've east. been to the east, we've been to the furthest point of the east of the world, we cross over to Kenya, mm -hmm. we've been everywhere, and the country is so beautiful, there's so much natural greenery, I particularly love the topography yeah. of Uganda, 
Like, if you're someone from New York or from America, from San Francisco, where you living in a corporate setting, mm -hmm. I think Uganda's therapy for the soul. True. Like, once you leave Kampala, just the beautiful hills, the mountains, just the trees. You could just be sitting in your car, just walking. Mm -hmm. You see all types of birds, like the parrots, the eagles. Like, it just, like, takes you to a place where it just, like, you get to experience National Geographic in Uganda. You understand? That's true. I think that's, like, the best way for me to describe it. If you're a nature lover, if you're somebody out there who loves going to Costa Rica for bird watching, I'm telling you oh, the species, best yeah. place to come bird watching species, is yeah. the great country of Uganda. Because you will see species of birds that you literally have never even imagined existing. And you could just be at the farm. <laughs> You're like, hey, what's this red bird here? What's this purple and yellow bird here? Remember even when we went to Kenya, we saw the guinea fowls that had the beautiful the colors, beautiful the long Kenya. tails. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, my goodness, what is this? Mm -hmm. But here in Uganda, everything is here. And I love the seasons, the mangoes. The mangoes Let me tell mangoes. you, when I first came to UG, I met this lady while I was stuck in Michigan mm -hmm. due to COVID. Yeah. I missed my flight. Mm -hmm. And... And I remember I met this lady who ran a nonprofit in in uh, in, in uh, yeah up there ginger. in Ginger, and then she was telling me, you know, have you ever had the Ugandan pineapple? I was, I'm thinking to myself, I don't really care for pineapple, but I hope they have mango. And then she was like, um, when you get there, when you taste the Ugandan pineapples, it's gonna be the most amazing pineapple you've ever had in your life. And I realized why I didn't really care for pineapple when I was living in America. Yeah. Because the pineapples that we have, that we have back in the U.S., the majority of it comes from Central and South America. Yeah. Right? And it was okay, but then the pineapples were so expensive. And then when you would spend your hard-earned cash on buying one or two, and it would just be bland and blasé, Right? So then when I got here to UG, when I tasted real pineapple, my favorite fruit nowadays pineapple. is pineapple followed by mangoes. Mm -hmm. The sweetest pineapples in the world exist here in Uganda. That is true. And I, I thought it was just a myth. You thought it was a I thought it was a myth. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how can Uganda have the sweetest <laughs> pineapples on the planet? Yes. But I think it's true. It is very, it's very true. It's 100% true. So. That's why you love Uganda? Wow. I like Uganda because of the people. I like the pace, mm -hmm. you know. I like how Ugandans are like down south nice, mm -hmm. where they're going to hit you with the bless your heart. <laughs> you know, <they're>, you know? <laughs> I'm being honest. Wow. They'll hit you with the bless, bless your, your heart. heart. Exactly. Your exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I just think, you know, Ugandans, I never, you know what it is? I love my Ghanaian folks. I love West Africa. I think Uganda is like the the best. The, I, I think I would say Uganda is like the the best hidden gem in Africa that most people most don't people realize. About, yes. But then when people come here, they realize, wow, Uganda is that place. You exactly. Know? I, have, I have a hunch mm -hmm. within the next couple of years, Uganda is going to be the Ghana, right? In terms of of a mass you know, um, transit, transition, yeah. right, from the diaspora to East Africa. East Africa. I know Kenya and TZ are currently in the two top spots right now. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't leave out Rwanda, right? Yeah. But I think as people get exposed themselves more to East Africa as a whole, I believe you're going to have a chance to definitely take the lead, yeah. you know, in time. Obviously, we have some work to do. We have to continue to improve our infrastructure, the roads. Mm -hmm. But I think the way the leadership is moving, the way the country is growing, you know, the, the culinary sophistication is improving. That is true. You know, I think UG has it all, you know, to be that country, yeah. you know, that everybody wants to actually have a condo here or two Airbnb setups. You know, I, I think, you know, you guys should consider all those options. That is so true.
I think we just need to expose and also you know, expose so much that we have in Uganda. Our tourism board should really do something better. I remember that first days you came here mm -hmm. and you were the birds mm -hmm. used to ask. And for us, we're not even more interested in the birds as mm -hmm. Ugandans. But you, coming to Uganda, you're very surprised you to see You were making fun of me because I was in awe. Of him while I, I was like, oh my God, look at the like, eagle. <laughs> look at this parrot. Did you see that blue parrot there? Did I do you see that? Because oh wow. we used to sing this all the mm -hmm. time. We see all types of birds here and we don't even care about them as Ugandans. It's sad. But when someone comes from a different country and comes here, they find it quite different. Which is very interesting. <laughs> so we just need to work on what we have here. Really appreciate that. You, you see what my brother Ali question. just said? What did he say? Oh, never knew that about the pineapples. This brother needs a commercial promoting. <laughs> <laughs> Between him and Oshay, they really <laughs> offend people. Okay, you offend people's uh, Hey, man, I love you, G. And you know, you know I'm real. That is if, real, if, but if, that is if, true. if I don't like something, no amount of money can make me say otherwise but no it's it's wonderful but not just that though i think you're gonna have some of the sweetest pineapple not apart from the pineapples you guys call it popo papa yeah. what was the name it's popo popo but where we're papaya. from it's called papaya mm -hmm. so you're gonna have some amazing papayas some of the best mangoes outside yeah. of the caribbean okay. i've ever experienced I mean, taste species. yeah like it's here in uganda yeah but then what's amazing, like where our farm is located, guys, maybe like a 30 minute drive away once you pass my past pig farm. Yeah. We are the, the, the our region is like one of the largest pineapple growing yeah, region in all of Uganda. Yes. So we ran into that, 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 that tri that triangle mm -hmm. where we need a cattle corridor, mm -hmm. we need the pineapple, the pineapple corridor, pineapple, yes. and of course, what's the third one? Um, Sugar cane. The sugar cane. A lot of sugar cane come from our the central That's area. The side, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's the there. Pineapples. By the way, mm -hmm. can I just say something here? Oh yes. Guys, let me give you one amazing opportunity I discovered in Uganda. Mm -hmm. We can't do everything. That's why we need help. Mm -hmm. You know, not everyone can eat or consume super processed sugar mm -hmm. right but there's a multi-million dollar opportunity that exists for the person who will heed this advice i'm about to give you guys the climate here in uganda is absolutely perfect to grow the super food one in particular you guys should consider coming to ug and establishing a better version for sugar because in Uganda we have a ton of sugar cane that takes forever to grow and it's highly processed sugar but imagine those of you who actually come to Uganda and decide to open a sugar beet farm mm. beets are definitely a superfood easily exported all across the globe right but particularly sugar beets can definitely be, ex uh, I would say, explore to provide an alternative version for healthier version of sugar. Because there are a lot of folks that are moving here that don't like to eat sugar. Yeah. At least not the typical highly processed sugar. Mm -hmm. But if we can actually get to the point of thinking down the line of establishing a sugar um, beetroot um uh plantation or farm right there's so much money to be made yeah. and within that industry so i remember being back in the u.s when agave took over the world i think sugar beetroot as a crop here in uganda can change everything here in east africa and you would definitely stand apart it will be a healthier variety you know and they're very easy to grow because if you get fertile soil which is most parts of Uganda, yeah. especially here in the central, Everywhere. or Kamoli, you know, wherever you country. go, yeah. land is just good. Yeah. Consider sugar beetroot. I've not seen That's that. my tip of the day. <laughs> 
Someone is saying pineapples are picked too early in the U.S. Is that true? Yeah, because a lot of the time it's in the refrigerated black box. It's crazy. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. Marshall is saying, I'm looking at three countries between Ghana, Zimbabwe, and Uganda. I don't know what should I go farming. Should I run my farm? Zimbabwe? What is it? Ghana, Zimbabwe, UG? Mm. Well, it depends on where you want to be, really. I mean, I love the way they do things in Zimbabwe. But the currency is definitely something you need to consider. But Zimbabwe is a beautiful country, mm. amazing soil, just very similar to that of Uganda. Okay. Um, I know that they definitely um, get more assistance from the government uh, in terms of subsidies um, in Zimbabwe. I'm not quite sure how it's done in Ghana because I never did farming in Ghana. But it depends on where you want to live, really where you want. can see yourself in the, for the long haul. Because farming is one of those, those fields that takes some time, right, for you to fully develop and get your sea legs or farming legs, so to speak. Mm -hmm. but, but once you figure that out, I think you're going to do fine wherever you land. That's you know? True. Yeah, Marshall left a comment earlier on. He so was anyway. saying about his... I stopped doing crops. I'm doing goats and chickens. Welcome, Very welcome to the goat's Even life. So, I'm mm -hmm. hearing stories that my goats died because they drank water, neighbor's water. I never been home over eleven years now. Oh, you can't do that, my bro. Let me tell you something. If you guys ever want to do farming, and if you're not around, there's ways to do it. Okay, you can potentially partner with reputable farmers to do what's called joint ventures, okay? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So somebody like myself and Tina, mm -hmm. we have a decent amount of land at our farm, right? So there are, there are times where we might say, okay, we're gonna purchase X amount of piglets, right? And we're gonna raise them for X amount of time, for a specific amount of time. And then when they're ready to go for processing, you know, whatever the profit comes from that from that the the, the rearing of those piglets mm -hmm. to what they go for on the open market then our team and that person who actually invested a portion of the money to purchase those piglets that's called a joint venture mm -hmm. that person don't own your farm you don't really they're not officially you know they just partnering with you on a specific venture so for example if you just wanted to do goat farming and then you find a reputable goat farmer, right, who's doing this professionally, you can definitely partner with someone. But there's also life crop, there's also livestock insurance that you can actually get on your livestock, right, in case of the worst, right? So you can still farm to some degree at a commercial level with an established commercial farmer. But finding companies and people to do these types of projects with is extremely difficult. I'm just giving you guys an example, right? Mm -hmm. But then don't think you're just going to buy a whole bunch of goats and chickens, you know, and just let your brothers take care of it or your sisters take care of it. Because the moment these folks run into difficulties, your animals become their, their that's like the golden parachute for them, you know? And a lot of the time, they may start off by taking one or two, but as life continues to happen, you know, it's not that these people are inherently bad. It's just sometimes circumstances turn you into something you never intended to be, mm -hmm. you know. But if you still have the desire, you have the capital, and you want to partner with reputable farmers, you know, there are things you can do. You know, we can definitely advise you guys on some of the people that we've worked with, yeah. you know, and a few, we've actually done it a couple of times, you know, on a very small scale, you know, um, with a few good, good friends of ours, you know, and the results ended up being positive. Um, but yeah, you know, you should consider doing projects on that scale versus just sending money home to your uncle. I remember, remember the gentleman that actually had the pig business with his wife Yeah. and he was sending money sending for money feed pigs, yeah. and the wife was just spending the money and not feeding the pigs. And so, although those pigs were almost like uh, seven months old, yeah. they barely looked like they were three months. 
That's remember that? I remember. Yeah, and when they, they went to the butcher, um, I think they weighed less than 15 kgs. They weighed so little. Yeah. Wow. Someone is saying, how about the, the staff? Yes, what is that? Mm -hmm. Let me in see. A, in Egypt. I don't see. Be... What's the name? Call you all one to drink water. I don't even see where you are. You're ahead of me. Yeah. What is it? Um, how about pistachios? Yeah, listen, all, the entire <clears throat> line is available, guys. Pistachios, it's a nut. It's a green, it's, a, it's, a, it's like, it's a nut. Like, just like um, macadamia, just like um, pine nuts. It's okay. another, it's in the nut family, right? Okay. Yeah, um, macadamia. Right now, it's, it's all here. <clears throat> Almond. As as, as as water restrictions continue to hit California, the world need their almonds for these fancy salads in California. If you can't grow almond in California or Arizona, guess the best place to come grow almonds? Uganda. <laughs> because we have water, mm -hmm. we have the climate, yeah. you know, and then the world will never stop eating almonds or pistachios or macadamia nuts, you know, or walnuts for that fact, for that fact right? And again, there's no competition. Do you know the majority of the cashew nuts that are currently being sold in Uganda right now comes from Tanzania? Did you know that? No. I do, because I love, I love, I love cashews. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Cynthia, I'll definitely be in South Africa with my peoples. <laughs> Zoom. You read that comment for Zoom. I don't see Zulu. What is that? Let me see. What do you recommend as a good starter arc for a farm, for a first time farmer? <sighs> first thing you do, my bro, um, you need to secure land. You need to understand the area you want to operate. You need to make sure that you have at least decent roads that you can get to and from your farm, even if it rains, right? That you actually have a, 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 a a consistent way mm -hmm. to get to and from your farm and i think to me if you guys were to listen to what i'm saying here i think if you're a new farmer especially here in uganda you guys should highly consider the following yeah. sheep farming huge opportunity snail farming huge opportunity Consider starting an apiary where you're just dealing with bees and honey and bee byproducts. Another mega opportunity. God, let me tell you something. There are, there are organizations that have been in Uganda for so many years. Mm -hmm. Set up by Caucasian folks from all over. Okay. Yes. That have been making millions of dollars in Uganda in the darkness. Secretly. They don't advertise. They don't no. promote. They don't even want you to know what they're doing <laughs> in the bush. I'm serious. This is true. Yes, I'm serious. serious. And these guys are here. They've set up the whole chain. You know, where they make your, where they literally make um, the, the hives. They're selling the process. And mind you, the honey that's grown here, they don't even sell it here in Uganda. It's going to the Netherlands. It's going to Denmark. It's going to the U.S. It's being sold to the UAE. You understand? And they're doing it in the shadows. I, I was stunned. Because yeah. you know, you guys know, we also tested bees on our farm. <laughs> and it wasn't until I started digging deep. I was like, wait a minute. These Negroes have been out here since the 1950s and 60s, you know, extracting the best honey from Uganda. Yeah. And they're selling it all over the globe. And they have their association. Yeah, for association. They're paying yeah. these local Ugandan farmers very little. Mm -hmm. So then it is up to you guys that are watching that are now on the program that understand the power of information and the power of exporting, right, to come into these spaces. But I think sheep farming is the easiest way to make farm to make money in farming. Because when it comes to dealing with sheep, sheep are so much more hardier than goats That's true. right and sheep literally raise themselves i think we just got somebody that actually 
Billy White. Thank you so much for the suggestion. Thank you, Billy White. Appreciate the love, bro. Mm -hmm. um, and so, sheep personally are so hardy. They're, they grow so fast. Mm -hmm. The growth rate is tremendous. And again, don't worry so much about the quote unquote finding the market because we have well over a million plus immigrants, yeah. right? And I'm talking about people from the part of the world that actually eat lamb and mutton, okay? So, and that market is severely underserved. You know, if I had to do it all over again, right? I, I My partner, I'm sure, is not convinced. Mm -hmm. She would have also supported me and starting out with the biggest sheep farm we could have built. Yeah. Right? Because, number one, when the sheeps give birth, they literally are the best nannies. They are. They, I've seen a dropper sheep in the wild drop a lamb, come back. The lamb was up and running within like five minutes. That lamb was just keeping up with mommy in the bush. You understand? But then with most goats, they're, they're way more delicate, even the local goats, right? You have pros and cons everywhere, right? But I would definitely say you should consider those options. And it's not just about livestock. Mm. You should also consider crop farming as well. I never in a million years would have thought growing beans would be such a profitable venture in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Beans here are so expensive. Yeah, very expensive, but it's something that you need to consider. Cynthia was still saying that I'm a new farmer. I think mm -hmm. she started the sheep farm, but some of her what lambs are dying. She's okay. saying I'm a new beginner farmer for both sheep and chicken but my sheep babies are dying after birth is there anything my guys are doing wrong yeah they could be doing a lot wrong mm -hmm. so the thing about sheep um even it depends also even though they're way hardier than goats it depends on the type of sheep that you have whether or not that there's inbreeding, inbreeding taking place mostly. because let me tell you something when you're not around okay a lot of the herdsmen that you have these people are lazy. Let me say this again. Come for me if you want. Most of those guys are super lazy. Okay? They know you can put your protocol in place. Mm. Right? But unless you're there to implement the protocol where you can actually monitor and have foot and eyes on the ground. Right? They know they're supposed to take the male sheep one direction and take the female sheep in another direction, what are they going to do? They're just going to just let them go out together. And they're not going to take they're not going to take notes, they're not going to keep records. So you may find yourself with all your sheep being you might have, you know, um the once inbreeding start, it's very difficult to decipher what's what, okay? So that might be the main reason or it might simply mean the fact that they're not deworming you know, these sheep consistently, or it might simply mean that when the, when the lambs are being born, mm -hmm. they're not being kept in a dry and warm space. Exactly. You understand? And so sheep, even though they're stronger, but if they're born and they're getting wet and the place gets cold at night, you understand? They can also be impacted by that as well. So that's, those could be some of the key factors, but also sometimes. the vaccinations, some, some, Disease may impact sheep and not impact goats or vice versa, right? So you need to make sure that, you know, when you do buy your breeding stock, you don't just buy them from the street or you don't just buy them from the market. You have to go to a reputable breeder. And even if you like that person, you should still test exactly. all of your animals. And of course, we have a video coming up when we actually went to a very good friend of ours, a guy that we trust and love. And have the utmost respect for. Guess what? When it was time for us to pick up our flock, we right? And we had booked those goats for a very long time. Mm -hmm. We literally brought our vet, our, our one of our section managers at the farm. Okay, they spent three days there almost. Yeah. Testing every single goat that we purchased, every single cow that we purchased had to be double checked by our team. So in your case. You know, it may be due to inbreeding. It may be because that they're not following the vaccination protocol. 
Yes. And it might just be because those those lambs are not being kept in a warm and dry space. Or it might be because the sheep itself are actually staying on the ground, right? And they're not in an elevated structure, structure. right? So there are, there are a multitude of factors that you need to really investigate because the number one answer that these hearse guys will tell you, everything's okay at the farm. And then your animals are dying. And they don't care. They have no remorse about what happens to your animals. So those are some of the insights I can give you, some of the, you know, the pointers, you know, that I can actually share with you. But the best bet is to actually, you know, get a vet on the ground, a reputable vet, which are extremely hard to find. Don't get me started on that. Mm -hmm. um, to actually try to see what's really happening with those sheep. That is true. What happened? Nope. But you double clicked on everything. <laughs> now you have to. Yeah, you saw what you did. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Um, how far have you gone with the market? Because when you're producing, it needs market for sale. Who's saying this? Charles Odifor. I don't see. Okay. What do you mean, how far have we gone with what market? I don't understand. I think he's meaning about selling what we have at the farm. Right now we are breeding, mostly. So, we are selling a few, of course, the piglets to our people. We're selling a lot of piglets. Yes. We're selling a lot of piglets. The thing is, we're also selling goats as well. We have a ton of male goats that are available for purchase. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of pigs are available for purchase. We're still breeding. We're still breeding to get to the numbers that we want for the goats, because the idea for the goats itself is to try to get, you know, to well over two to three thousand, you know, at the farm, and that's the target we're going for. Mm -hmm. And so far, so good. We're making great progress. Yeah. So Bill, who has given us the super chat, was asking about the consultation. He needs consultation. So I've shared with you our email address then also our contact so bill you can definitely reach us through that so that we can set up time and we do the consultation with you thanks william mm -hmm. now guys please mm -hmm. look into the sugar beet aspect of the crops i'm telling you that is like so you would definitely be able to print money when you start making your billions i just want my 10 percent advisory <laughs> Because I'm I'm giving you guys the real deal info here. Hey. I'm telling you, it's a massive opportunity here. Because there are a lot of people that have diabetes that really can't deal with regular sugar or you know, but the, the beetroot, the sugar, the, 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 the sugar the sugar beet itself, the sugar is amazing and you can't even tell the difference except for it's much healthier for you. Okay. Yeah. Zul is asking, have you thought about doing with birds like ostrich? That's a really intriguing question. <laughs> I knew you were going to like that one. <laughs> uh -huh. Who asked that question? Zulu. Zulu FBS. Zulu, let me tell you something. The short answer to that is yes. And at some point in the future, I would love nothing more. Because the opportunities within those birds, the meat itself as an export mm -hmm. meat to the US, to the UK. By the way, even exporting the, the, the actual skin for shoe craftsmen, right? To actually, I'm telling you, the opportunities within ostrich farming, both in terms of like the meat, the feathers, the eggs, the skin, the meat, the multipliers there are just tremendous. Zulu is a very smart person. <laughs> and you know I love smart people, so great, great question. Wow, that is really nice. Alan is saying if you are doing cash crop rotation, what would your rotation be? <sighs> wow. Um, I have to say, for me, I would definitely do, well, it depends on what you want to do, you know? I never would have imagined bamboo being a cash crop, but it is. It's a very, very healthy cash crop here in Uganda. Um, even though the, the sector is still underserved, it's still growing. Beans, of course, is another one, which I didn't expect or anticipate, right? 
A lot of people do coffee here. I'm not a fan of coffee, but some people, that's what they've been doing forever. Um, I personally, I wouldn't just think about just basic cash crops. I would just think about something a bit long term. That's not just seasonal. Mm -hmm. I would consider definitely getting into macadamia. I would definitely consider getting into cashews. Absolutely consider getting into um, has avocado. Um, but then the too. one, the one thing that most people sleep on in Uganda, mm -hmm. the flower market is enormous. Let me say this again. If you can get your hands on a couple of greenhouses, two crops. Flowers is one. The next one would be tomatoes. I'll give you a third one as a bonus. Mm -hmm. Peppers, chilies, green peppers, red peppers. But tomato, flowers, green or red pepper, the market is there. And I'm not talking locally. I'm talking these flowers can be grown here and be shipped directly to the Netherlands, Switzerland, Denmark, France, year round, okay? And we're talking high profit margin. We're talking, you're getting paid in euros. That's what I have to tell you, you know? And it's there, you know? Yeah, true. I see you. I see you, man. <laughs> I'm doing something here. So someone is saying I'm a beginner farmer for goat's sheep and chicken, but my sheep oh that is something you read that one already. Yeah. Cynthia, it's something I wanted to read from Alan, I think. No, she says Cynthia's laughing. What's so funny, Cynthia? I don't know. This was what I was looking for, sorry. Mm -hmm. Do you have an animal breeding farm? Mm -hmm. I'm a goat farmer and I have cases where healthy goat comes from grazing to making some funny sounds like it's having internal Injury, injuries and is anemic then within a few hours it dies any advice for that there are really so many causes yeah. of that honestly the you know that sound like chlorosis honestly but then again there could also be you could also have some of your herds men mm. right that will take these goats out to to feed and sometimes they eat poisonous shrubs it's not as common but it's possible yeah but then the main reason ghosts will just drop dead like that is custodiosis and so that's a matter of you vaccinating and deworming your your goats on a regular schedule um you know to protect them from the elements right yeah true and so sometimes worms will attack some of your healthiest goats sometimes those internal parasites will be doing a number on some of your best looking goats at the farm. And a lot of the time, there's this real contagious pneumonia that they can get also, yeah. where the goat look 100% healthy. healthy. And then yes. like they could just be running around and you just hear just bear and then boom, mm -hmm. down goes the goat. And there's nothing you can do about that. Apart from vaccinate, vaccinate, maintain a schedule. And of course, maintain your records so that you stay on schedule with all of your actual treatment protocol, you know? And um, the, I think that's like the, the sh most straightforward way I can answer that question for you. That's true. Wow. Guys, someone is saying you guys provide fresh new ideas in farming. That's after that William, is, right? Yes, that is William. Yeah. Thank you, William. <clears throat> Yeah, I've been thinking about doing ostrich for a while. I've only got 15 right now. What? Out Where are you, Zulu? Out here. I live in the USA. Okay, nice. Ostrich, let me tell you something. One ostrich egg is like the equivalent of like 20 chicken eggs, I think. No, it's serious. Not only that, though, the ostrich egg shell itself is used for decorations. Um, they can actually make like yeah. like actual art out of yeah. man ostrich is the new to me the opportunity with ostrich is tremendous big fan big fan of ostrich both ostrich burgers and ostrich meat you know I'm a fan I've had ostrich you've eaten ostrich yes it's super lean it's very what healthy better than turkey 
better than than dry ass turkey. Excuse my language. Hey. Yeah. And turkey is more tastier, you know. I like. Turkey. I love turkey, but turkey breast, turkey again, is good. But I like ostrich better. Okay. Which one? The beets are great for feed crop. Yeah, for feed crops. I am mixing grass. I don't really know what daikon, that is. Daikon, radish, uh, sorghum, willow. Oh, look at the you're yeah, already geez. doing it, man. You know, Alan is already Alan is already ahead of the curve, you know? Yeah, this is great. Keep up the good job. What else? What are your thoughts on small farm machines such as Tudorworth? No. <sighs> well, to begin, you have to start from somewhere. Um, I think you start with what you have and you, you upgrade when you're able. When you're able to. Yeah. Because even with us now, it's time for us to get a tractor. <laughs> you know, After man, time. it's time. <laughs> <laughs> it's time, man. I've seen oxen in the field. <laughs> you know, are you delirious? I think Tito's too tired. <laughs> I've seen literally <laughs> stuff I used to see in the movies where I'm seeing oxens mm -hmm. just plowing like the 1920s. Mm -hmm. But you still use them here. Yeah. Right? They're very common here. Yes. They're valuable, you know? Mm -hmm. These guys are going around with their oxens just like tilling land. Um, but no, handheld tractors are great, um, you know, to start. It's not ideal, but it's a start. Yeah, but to really purchase a tractor in the beginning, it's not it's really... It's not necessary. It's not necessary. Yeah. At least use the human labor, which is also available in most of our villages, and cheap, by the way. So you can always hire people to come and help you till the land. You can use your oxen as well, till your land. So for the beginning, do not spend so much money in tractors and all this machinery here. But as the farm grows, you definitely need to purchase You that need a tractor ease, as you get to a certain scale. Yeah, to ease work, to ease everything at your farm. But seriously, guys, I think we are coming to a close of this live stream. Yeah, because my eyes, I'm looking at the phone <laughs> and I, I don't know if I need glasses or it's the fact <laughs> that it's almost two o'clock in the morning. Um, I really can't even read anything on the screen unless I bring it this close. So, let's close out. Yeah. Guys, this has been great. Thank you so much. I don't know what Cynthia is saying exactly. That's not <laughs> possible, Cynthia. <laughs> Cynthia's <laughs> telling stories. <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia is called, and she's doing what they call trolling. She's trolling. <laughs> she's trolling. She's trolling Are you us serious? here. Oh, you're just... She's trolling. <laughs> What are some of the crops that are high in demand in Uganda for local or regional consumption, but also internationally? Okay, sweet potatoes and all that. So for the crops that are really commonly on a high demand here, it's matoke. That, those are the green uh, bananas. That's, that's not the only one. One of them. That's one of them, but like yes. the main one is maize. Maize, yeah. That's maize, it. then we have the soya. Maize, beans. Then we have what else? That it's is. maize, beans, matoke, matoke is cool. and then rice is okay. also important. But although most people just eat the matoke and posho, um, matoke and posho. Mm -hmm. But for posho, I mean for maize, it's really on high demand in all of East Africa. It comes from Uganda, goes to Kenya, goes to Sudan. Tanzania, Rwanda, Congo, they all. My all brother all Mustafa here. was in the chat. Are you serious? Represent. <laughs> he has sent you a message. Yeah, he sent me the the, the, the portion. The portion. And, and Mustafa, no, it's real, man. Like, the, the love is real, man. I'm so proud of my bro. He's out there. The baby just came. I hope the baby should be here. Because okay. I think he went back to the U.S. briefly because he was expecting, expecting the, baby. you know, the, his child, the, you know. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing you again, my guy. When you come back east, let me know. Mm. And um, we definitely have to get up when you get back. Yeah.
for Cynthia, you are calling her what does she want? <laughs> what Cynthia is trolling, man. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling Cynthia is actually William's secondary school. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's form up in here, you know, coming for you, Tina. Ah, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wonderful. Great show, guys. Thank you so much, Raymond Mugera. But guys, we really appreciate you guys. It's coming to 2 a.m. here in Uganda. It is. It's 7 to 2. <laughs> 2 I don't even know how I'm still awake. <laughs> yeah, like, so I'm, I'm a zombie at this point. Yeah. But we really appreciate you guys so much. For those who have been really watching us, we apologize for the first stream that really got disorganized a little bit. You know, with the technical issues, sometimes it's beyond our control. But we really appreciate each of you who are subscribed and for those who have not yet subscribed because the majority of the people who watch our videos have not really subscribed to our channel. I don't know why. I don't know why you guys are not clicking that red button of subscription so that you can know more about what we are sharing right here. But we really appreciate you guys so much. Then we also have our social media platforms, Instagram, which is Value Farm UG. We have Facebook, Value Farm, TikTok, Value Farm. You know, you go and see Guys, we literally series. like, I think we're about a hundred away from hitting 4K on Instagram. on Instagram. Give us a follow on Instagram because we definitely post a lot of behind the scene footage. There's so much more coming up. Coming up. You know? Oh my God. Let me even tell them about the video that is coming up mm -hmm. on Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, it's up to you if it's ready to go. It's ready. The video is ready, but I think we shall definitely put it up for Monday mm -hmm. since we did this live stream today. We don't want to bombard you. I know most people have not really watched from the beginning and most of you have to go back and watch the whole stream. So we are going to put up a video on Monday and that video, oh my God, is so inspirational. If you're a farmer out there, especially people from the diaspora we brought for you someone else we hosted someone else who has been into the farming business and is very successful so i'm super excited about that video by the way because when i was even editing it i was happy while editing the video because this is what i want other people out there to also listen to also you know get motivation from to start their own farms and this video guys do not miss if you must <laughs> because this one here, seriously, we went to Sinjiro and his story is amazing. And how he's doing his thing that side is very inspirational. So if you want to start a farm, if you want to really do something for yourself, I think that video is going to get you somewhere. Our friend Mark, I'm yes. so proud of him. I'm so, he's, I was so he's, happy. He's an amazing so, person. So that is a video for Monday, guys. Turn your notification bells. So that you don't miss out on that upload because it's coming up on Monday. We shall definitely put it up on Monday. Yeah. But we really appreciate you guys so much. God bless you. We need to go for now. Thank you for tuning in. Thank mm -hmm. you for the love. Thank you for always supporting VF as a team. Mm -hmm. You know, we came from a long ways, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and even though we're here, guys, we share this information with y'all. It's because we know how tricky yeah getting into farming can be it's not rocket science but it can feel like it when you don't know where to start and so we try to share with you guys what you know as a way for you to avoid some of the common mistakes that we made in the beginning yeah and we love to share our journey to show you guys where we've been where we are now and where we're going so we hope you guys continue to support us continue to show up for us as we try to show up for you guys yeah. um with the info on a weekly basis and um yeah for all the love and support thank you and uh we'll see you guys next time Asante sana. <laughs> what how do you You're say good night no first, <laughs> first say Au good revoir. night good night okay good night in your languages come that on is... tina i'm too in tired Creole. no come on okay in Creole. oh thank you passe bonne nuit au revoir <laughs> She's just a show. Let me speak all that. All right, guys. Good night. We love you all. See you in the next one. Bye. Bye. <laughs>